Uh, good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as uh, we get ready to begin. Uh, dear Father, Lord in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for uh, this time that we can have our Sunday school. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, using this time as we continue, Father, Lord, to, uh, to help your people, Lord, in the area, Lord, uh, where they can be able, Lord, to continue to grow. Lord, may you use your, your word as well as, Father, Lord, your, your vessels, Lord, of instrument today, our Sunday school teachers, as uh, they impart, Lord, the, uh, the truth of your word today. And, Lord, we pray that you will continue to hasten uh, the coming, Lord, of your people, as well as, Father, Lord, the, uh, uh, you, may you cleanse us, Father, Lord, from all our sins, O oh God. And bless us now, Lord, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning to all of you. Okay, uh, today we will continue our lesson in in the book of Acts. Okay, and uh, we do appreciate the uh, the uh, participation of uh, and the assistance of preacher Albert Aquino in helping us uh, complete uh, the fifth chapter of uh, the book of Acts. Okay, and this morning. Um, we will not. We will not quite. Uh, we will not quite cover uh, Acts chapter six uh, just yet. But there was actually a, a need that came up. It was actually one of our preachers um, who was attending our Sunday school, and he said, "Pastor, you know, I really thank the Lord for our Sunday school, our English Sunday school." But uh, he wanted to get some background as to what the book of Acts is all about. Okay? So in the meantime, today, and hopefully we'll be able to finish it today and also next Sunday, uh, we'll go ahead and, and, and deviate from our Sunday school, uh, at least from chapter 6, and we will cover a survey in the book of Acts. It's actually uh, Preacher Jerome who, who um, requested that uh, we do a survey in the book of Acts because he he was really interested with regards to the uh, the Sunday school lesson that our church is having in the area of uh, the book of Acts. So this morning, I want you to please turn your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 1. Okay? And we already prayed. So the, the initial part of our lesson this morning will be about this, the survey pertaining to the book of Acts. And uh, as um, we are learning about to learn about this, uh, I, I have to admit that we also continue to learn as teachers because we have to uh, do our own studying ourselves. You know? And the, this morning... Uh, we will be reviewing the book of Acts um, uh, this morning. And I want to, uh, to share with you what we have actually learned uh, in our Bible college. You know, uh, uh, way back we had covered a few weeks of lesson on pedagogy, which is the art of teaching okay, that, uh, that Pastor Ernest uh, shared with us. And I would like to also apply um, what we have learned uh, also at, uh, at work. And from time to time, you know, we take advantage of these trainings that, that our company would send us to, off-site trainings. And um, I remember sometime last year they had uh, sent us to an eight-hour uh, training off-site uh, with regards to um, effective um, communication skills. And it's, it's really very helpful. It helps us uh, to be able to uh, get our ideas across. Uh, and uh, in this training that we had, um, where we were um, given the opportunity to learn uh, about the effective communication skills, uh, we also learned how to be able to interview uh, candidates who are applying for a job. Okay, so from time to time, you know, we, we need help. Um, that's one of the functions that 
that I do at work is I have to uh, interview candidates, you know, whether they're, they would be the best fit for, for the job, whether they have the skills. So, you know, we have sets of questions that we need to ask them. And also, uh, the right questions to ask when, you know, we are performing internal audits in our company, you know. And um, also when we give performance reviews to uh, some of our co-workers, okay. And, you know, we will try to better understand the Book of Acts uh, this morning uh, by asking certain questions, okay. And uh, I remember one of the things that, that we learned is uh, they taught us how to be able to ask uh, open questions. You know, if, if Pastor Hernes um, shared this with us also about open questions. And, you know, you may, you may want to ask yourself, and going back to our notes and also what we have learned, what is an open question? Okay? An open question is a question that should provide us with in-depth answer uh, about something. Okay? But with regards to open questions, you cannot be able to answer an open question with just one or two words. Okay? But uh, an open question normally starts with the words how, it normally starts with the word why, which, when, where, and what. Okay? Those are the words that open questions start out with. And normally they are asked at the beginning of a consultation or a conversation. Okay? And here in our, in our Sunday school setting, this will... This is, we will use these open questions to help us better understand um, what the book of Acts is all about. Okay? And normally, uh, as, as I said, these open questions are asked at the beginning of a consultation or conversation to get as much initial information as possible before we move on to a specific uh, detail. Okay? So this morning, uh, as I said, we will be studying about the book of Acts and we will use open questions to help us better understand what the book is all about. Okay? So, the first question, okay, as far as what the book of Acts is, okay, what is the book of Acts? Okay? Does anybody would like to, to share their insights as to what their understanding is the, about the book of Acts? Okay? Uh, Richard Burt. Okay? Well, that was, you know, uh, what uh, Richard Bert, uh, Bert shared with us. There's really uh, a lot of truth to what he said what, as far as what the Book of Acts is, is concerned. And, you know, um, I'm so glad that, uh, that uh, in our Sunday school we can be able to, to hit uh, two birds with one stone, you know, because, you know, we, we know for a fact that Sunday school is the number one teaching arm of the church, right? And uh, how I wish, you know, and the pastor always encourages us that we have more of our preachers, you know, those who uh, do not have responsibilities to be attending Sunday school as well. Because, you know, uh, in Sunday school, uh, especially what we're covering now, they're not only um, uh, learning about uh, Sunday school, but uh, we're going to be covering a survey on the book of Acts. Okay? And that's one of the, uh, the uh, classes that is being offered in our uh, Bible college, you know the survey of the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts. And, um, you know, the book of Acts, as Preacher Bert mentioned, is a very unique book. Okay? 
if there is a, uh, a historical book that is equivalent to the book of, uh, I would say, Joshua and the other uh, historical books in the Old Testament, it would be the book of Acts. Okay? That would be the, uh, the New Testament counterpart of the book of Joshua and, and uh, uh, both in the Old Testament because um, uh, this book that we're studying about, the book of Acts, is uh, unique and it's also a very uh, crucial uh, book of the New Testament. And the very reason why we, we consider this as very unique and very crucial because it is um, a continuation of uh, uh, the details pertaining to the work that the Lord Jesus Christ started. Okay? That's why it's very crucial. And that's how we can be able to see how the gospel moved uh, from, uh, from Jerusalem to the, the uttermost part of the earth. And it, uh, it is also unique and also very special in a sense because it presents an extensive picture of the early church, uh, early church life and also history. You know, that's why, you know, uh, this is one of the books that I, I like to read in, in the uh, New Testament, you know, because it, it helps us better understand um, what the church was doing in the early days. And, and many of the things that we are doing in our church now, we can be able to see um, them being started in the book of Acts and being continued uh, by our church today. And that's why it's unique in, in that sense. And if you remember, and the reason why I ask you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 1, in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, I want to ask Sister Teresa to please read for us Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Mr. Teresa. So here, you know, this is the uh, this is actually the the main verse that we will be using as we study the survey of the Book of Acts. Okay, Acts chapter one, verse eight. And here in Acts 1.8, interestingly, uh, in a nutshell, uh, we can be able to, to deduce from this verse in Acts 1.8 that this verse suggests that Acts, the book of Acts is a story of the men and women, okay? the men and women okay, who took the Great Commission seriously and they began to spread the gospel or the news of the risen Savior. From Jerusalem to the most remote corner of the known world at that time. Okay? So, it's so interestingly, we can be able to learn from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You, you read this over and over again, and it, it suggests one thing that when the Lord Jesus Christ gave the, the Great Commission, and as the Lord Jesus Christ stood in, in Mount of Olives, and as he stood before, um, the 120 members of the first century church, we can be able to see here that those people didn't just hear okay, what the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, but they embraced. They embraced the mandate that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to them. And what they did was they, they did not only uh, take in what the Lord Jesus Christ said up here, but what they had done with it was that they, they, they have actually um, uh, surrendered and committed their life in fulfilling that purpose that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to them. Which is why, you know, in a nutshell, we can be able to see in Acts 1.8 that the, the book of Acts is a story of the men and women who took the Great Commission seriously and how they began to spread the gospel. By the way, that's our theme, right? The theme for the year 2018 is standing firm on the truth of the gospel. And that's how they, they stood firm on the truth of the gospel. They did not just believe, but they acted on it. That is what, that, and that, that, is, that is the emphasis of our first quarter. They lived the gospel, and they did by carrying on the mandate that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to them. So, what they did was, they, they, have, they didn't have the Bible just yet. Okay? The Bible was not complete yet, but, but they know one thing. Okay? They know the gospel is already completed. Okay? That, that the Lord Jesus Christ had died, He had resurrected, and He had he had, uh, he, you know, um, uh, they have a news to, to tell the world now that 
they serve a risen Savior. So now, what they had, what they had done with it, with what they have, is they brought it from Jerusalem, and then they extended it to the neighboring places around it, and even to the uttermost part of the world, which is the farthest part of that world, the, of the known world at that time. And um, history would tell us that the gospel reached as far as Rome at that time. So we can be able to see here, uh, as, as people of God, that it is not only a story of men and women who took the Great Commission seriously, but the book of Acts, which we, again we are still on uh, trying to answer the first open question about the book of Acts. What is the book of Acts all about? But the book of Acts is also a continuation. If you go to the book of Acts 1.1, uh, Pastor Doji, please read for us Acts 1.1. Okay, so here, as uh, Pastor Doji had, had read for us, Acts 1.1 tells us that this is a continuation of all that the Lord Jesus Christ began both to do and to teach. So there is a strong evidence here that we can be able to find in Acts 1.1 that the church started during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? See, if, if, if it did not start during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, then they had nothing to continue with, right? But the Bible says that the, that the church um, uh, continued all that the Lord Jesus Christ began to do, both to do and to teach. That the Lord Jesus Christ started the church during his earthly personal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the very reason why we have an emphasis on that this morning is because, you know, if you, if you try to to get some um, understanding of what the book of Acts um, suggests, many people would tell you, even scholars would tell you, that the church started in the day of Pentecost. Many of them would tell you that. Many of them would tell us that. You know, in, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, they would use that as the evidence. They do, not, they do not tell you, they do not tell others that what happened in the day of Pentecost was not the, the start of the church, but the empowerment of the church. Okay? Which means that, you know, the, the Holy Spirit was, was never away. The Holy Spirit has always been there. Okay? He, he was there even during the time of creation, the Bible tells us that. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. But what happened was, in the book of uh, Acts, particularly in chapter 1 and also in the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was manifested in a way that He has never been manifested before. In this, this time around, because the Lord Jesus Christ will be, will be leaving uh, the presence of the disciples, what happened in the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of the Lord Jesus Christ's promise in John 14, 15, and 16. That when the Lord Jesus Christ is gone, He will not leave the disciples, He will not leave the church comfortless, but He will leave them somebody who will comfort them. He will leave them the paraclete, which is the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the fulfillment of, of, the, of the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, himself. So uh, that's why we can be able to see here. That's why in, in the uh, response to the, to the answer of uh, Preacher Bert uh, to, the, to the first open question that we had, that even though this book is entitled The Acts of the Apostles, these apostles would have not been able to do what they did if it wasn't for the presence of the Holy Spirit. You see? We, we, we identify with the human instrumentality okay, of Peter, of, of John, uh, uh, Peter, John, and also Paul. But more importantly, we identify with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because the, the, the gospel would have not been able to, to move forward. The gospel would have been able to accomplish such if it wasn't for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit among these men and women. Amen? Uh, similarly to, to how we also identify with how important the ministry of the Holy Spirit is uh, in our lives. So, moving right along in our study this morning, for those of you who just um, came on board this morning, we're studying uh, the book of Acts and we're doing a survey on it uh, per the uh, request of one of our church members. And, um, and each section of the book of Acts, right? Okay, it's actually divided into three sections. 
The book of Acts is divided into three, three sections. Uh, chapter 1 to 7, chapters 8 to 12, and chapters 13 to 28. Okay? And there's a reason why the book of Acts is divided into these sections. Because each of these sections that I shared with you, Acts chapter 1 to 7, Acts 8 uh, to 12, and Acts 13 to 28, they focus on a particular audience. Okay? They focus on a particular audience. And then they also focus on a particular personality. Okay? Like for instance, in, in chapters 1 to 7, the focus is particularly particularly the Jerusalem, okay? the Jews. Okay? And then the one that is actually, the personality that's actually in focus is Peter. Okay? And that, is the, that would be the same for Acts chapter 8 to 12 and Acts chapter 13 to 28. Like Acts chapter 13 to 28 would be focused no longer on the Jews, but the Gentiles, okay, to the, the uttermost part of the world, okay, and the non-Jewish uh, community. But the personality that is addressed there is no longer Peter, but the center of attention would be Paul. Okay. So, as most, most scholars believe that this book is the, uh, the second volume also of the two-part work of, of Luke. Okay? Okay, so the book of Acts is the, uh, the second volume in a two-part work of Luke. Okay? And of course, you, you may wonder, you know, Pastor, what are you talking about? If this is the, the, the second volume of the two-part work of Luke, the, the first part of his work would be the book of uh, Luke, which, which is the gospel, the third gospel. Okay? And we're going to be studying more on that. Okay? And as, as, you, as most of us would know, most Greek manuscripts, okay, this is what they, they have actually used to, to translate okay? the, the textus receptus that, that we know about. Okay? And most Greek manuscripts written at the time Okay, of Luke, uh, were given by the title, um, by the Greek title, pra -exis, okay, which is spelled P-R-A-X-E-I-S. Okay? So any, any manuscripts uh, written at that time would be given the title pra -exis, meaning Acts. And that is to give credit to the people who have contributed to the activity pertaining to that subject. Okay? So, in this case, the way that they have actually translated the writing of the apostles is praexis um, in Greek literature was used to summarize the accomplishments of outstanding men. So, the book um, focuses primarily on the acts of two apostles. So, Praexis uh, by Peter, chapters 1 to 12, and then Paul, chapter 13 to 28. Okay? So, if Pastor Doji was an author back in the days, and he would be writing on, on Greek manuscripts, okay? he would always start his manuscripts, and he would give a title to his manuscripts with the, the term Praexis, P-R-A-X-E-I-S. But in this case, because it is the Acts of the Apostles, it would just be right for us to be able to make mention of the two certain characters that were used by God as the central figures um, as we divide the book of Acts into these two sections, which would be from chapters 1 to 12, it would be Peter, and then from Acts 13 to 28, it would be Paul. Okay? So before we move to the right, uh, next section, does anybody uh, have any questions or comments? As we give, uh, give uh, do uh, justice to what, what the book of Acts is, again, in a nutshell, it is, the, uh, it is the, um, the work of men and women who took the Great Commission ser seriously as they uh, spread the gospel or the message of the risen Savior from Jerusalem to the uttermost part of the world or the known world at that time. That, that is what the book of Acts would be. Okay? 
So does anybody have any questions or any comments? Anybody would like to add something? Would like to, uh, anybody? Uh, preacher Gabe. That would also be one, one of the uh, uh, one way of putting it, okay? Because in that, that, that's why he said, and you shall be witnesses of me in these different places. Okay? And of course, they're not going to uh, be telling about the, the, their own righteousness, but they would be declaring the righteousness of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And what, what God or what the Lord Jesus Christ had, had done to them. And that's why, you know, um, the, the Bible says that... Uh, when these people, even though these people whom the Lord used were unlearned men, they were ignorant men, uh, the Bible says because they had been with Jesus, they were able to identify them as they had been with Jesus because they were able to display, they were able to manifest the attributes that the Lord Jesus Christ um, you know, had because you know, they lived with him, they dwelt with him, and the Lord Jesus Christ pretty much poured out his life uh, into them uh, for more than three years. That's why you know they they serve as witnesses, and at that time you know the you know the Bible was not complete yet, so there could be no other witness, better witness than their life. And that and this pastor here. Thank you, Pastor Ernest. Thank you, Preacher Gabe. That's why, you know, you, if you look in the Gospels, the, the Gospels only covered to the Jews. Okay? But not until they, they were not given the, uh, the command, they were not given the mandate, until, you know, to, do, to go to the uttermost part of the world and the neighboring places, until the Holy Spirit manifested himself the way he did. Okay? So that's a, that's a good, uh, very good point that Pastor Ernest pointed out. Uh, the first time around in the Gospels, their outreach is only to the, the chosen people of God, his, um, the Jews, okay, the Hebrew people. But now this time around, it would be to the Gentiles. The Gospel is now for, for everybody. Okay? So having said that, okay, now let's now cover. Okay, we, we just covered, for those of you who just sat down, you know, we're, we're covering a survey on the book of Acts as far as what is the book of Acts about. Now, who wrote the book of Acts? Okay. Again, if you go to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1, okay, it says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, okay, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. And then, it demonstrates here in Acts 1, 1, uh, clearly that the name author of the book of Acts is also the same author of the third gospel. If you go to the book of Luke, let us try to see the similarity as far as the, the language that is used. In Luke chapter 1 verse 3, and I would like to request Sister Adriana please to read for us. It will help, help us better understand who the author of the book of Acts. Luke chapter 1 verse 3. Yes, please. mention a fellow. Okay? Uh, we do not know exactly who 
who Theophilus is, but that's not, that is not um, what we're after in these verses. But we know that he could, he could have been a Roman official. He could have been somebody of, uh, of a higher office, which is why they address him that way. But what we are after, as far as in trying to see the correlation between Acts 1-1 and Luke chapter 1, verse 3, is the language that is used. And it demonstrates clearly that the name author of the book of Acts is the same uh, name author of the third gospel. Okay? And certainly, as we put these two verses side to side, it was certainly Luke who was the author of the gospel and also the author of this historical book. And, but then, if, if some people cannot be convinced by, by, that, um, by that line of thought, there is something that is more convincing, which is why we, we appreciate the fact that we can be able to use the scriptures to help us better, under, better answer the questions as we um, come along. Okay? Because the very reason why we know that Luke is the author of the book of Acts okay, is that there is an evidence contained in the Bible at least three places. Okay? And I want you to write this down and then we will visit one of them uh, to, to prove a point here this morning. Okay? Uh, if you're taking notes, put down Acts chapter 16, verses 10 to 17. Also Acts chapter 20, verse 5 to Acts chapter 21, verse 18. And then the third one is Acts chapter 27, verse 1, to Acts 28, verse 16. Okay? Again, Acts 16, verses 10 to 17, Acts 20, verse 5, to Acts 21, verse 18, and then Acts chapter 27, verse 1, and Acts chapter 28, verse 16. Okay? Let's go ahead and visit Acts 16. Okay? And I want to request... Uh, Sister Rhea, please read for us. To 17. Thank you. So it's very important. You know, this is one of, one of the very important chapters uh, in all of scriptures that we can find Acts chapter 16 because uh, not only do we find here in chapter 16 the companions, of the, the companions that Apostle Paul had okay, as he started spreading the gospel. Okay? But this is also in Acts chapter 16 is the start of the Philippian church. Okay? And the, the very first convert that we can be able to find here in Acts chapter 16 was Lydia, the lady who was a seller of purple. Okay? And then if you re read right along in Acts chapter 16, you'll hear about the, the young lady who was um, uh, owned by uh, these men. And she was known to, you know, to, uh, to be having like a special kind of talent. But of course, we know it's not something of, of God. And then there's another thing here where we can be able to see the conversion of the Philippian jailer. But here, I want us to pay attention um, in these three passages, particularly in Acts chapter 16, the, the first person pronoun we, okay? the personal pronoun we okay, in plural form, okay? which helps us understand that other than Paul, there had to be other people with him. Okay? 
And the ones that we, we know, if, if we read the, the rest of the chapter, we can find here that the one who was with Paul at that time was Silas. Okay? And then, if I was the one writing something, and I, I would have to include myself okay, in the narration, then I would, it would be safe for me to say that I was also a personal eyewitness. That I was there myself. Okay? So, we can be able to see here that the evidence, one of the evidence that we can be able to see here in these three wee passages is that the author himself, which is Luke, okay, used the first person plural pronoun, evidently placed himself into the narrative with Paul. Okay? Which means that he was there. He was there right along with Paul. He was able to see. He did not say, he did not uh, attribute the work as to being done by somebody that, but he placed himself right on the spot, right where Paul was. The author himself, okay, in the case of Luke, distinguished himself from Paul's other companions in the book of Acts by naming them. And that's the very reason why he named them specifically, okay, to tell them that, okay, other than Paul, there were others there, but I want you to do also think that I'm also there. I was also a, an eyewitness. And the Bible tells us that only Titus and Luke could have been with Paul during each of the three wee passages. But at least in this first wee passages in Acts 16, it was Silas and Luke. But in all three of them, the ones that could have only been with Paul would have been Titus and Luke only. Okay? But as you can see, as the book of Acts closed, the author placed himself beside Paul at the Roman imprisonment. You can be able to find that in, in Acts chapter 28, verse 16. And then, turn to Philemon 24. Okay? okay, don't look so shocked because there is the book of Philemon. Okay? Philemon 24. Okay, and Filipino pastor said, Pandelimon 24. <laughs> pastor Doji, please read for us Philemon 24. Mm -hmm. Philemon 24, right? Okay. So here, in this epistle, Paul stated that Luke, not Titus was with him at the time. Okay? So, we can be able to see here that all along, okay, not only that Luke had access to the personal eyewitness of the church life okay, and what was going on with the church, but he was there himself. He, was also, he also had access to the other personal eyewitness. So that's why he was able to also interview many of them. But that's the very reason why we, we adhere uh, God's people at IVBC to the Lucan authorship of the book of Luke and also the book of Acts. It's because of this internal evidence that we can be able to find in the scriptures. And, and most scholars also would agree in this view. You know, very rarely, okay, very rarely would you be able to come across a scholar okay, who would uh, say that it wasn't Luke who was uh, responsible in writing the book of Acts or the book of Luke. But it would have to be um, taken in, in that sense using uh, those evidence that we can be able to find in Acts 16, 10 to 17, Acts 20, and also Acts chapter uh, 27. Okay? Before we continue with, with this regard, um, and I, we, will, we have something else to add with regards to the authorship of the book of Luke. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Have, you guys, have you guys heard anything different other than you know, what we are learning this morning that Luke was the author of the book of Acts? Okay. There's, another, there's another internal evidence that we can be able to, uh, to also include um, that will even support that idea as well. Okay. Anything else? Any, any questions or any comments? Richard John, you have any questions? Okay. 
So another thing why, why we support this uh, idea, it's not a theory, it's an idea actually, is that secondly, we can be able to see that the author of this book, okay, the, the author of the book of Acts, uh, gave some evidence of being a physician. Okay? He gave, um, what do you call that, um, uh, some, um, some insights concerning of being a physician. Okay? By the attention that he gave to medical detail. Okay? There are at least a couple of places where, where Luke gave attention to medical detail. Okay? Let me give you two of them. Okay? In the book of Luke, chapter 8, verse 43, he gave one. Okay? He gave one attention to medical detail. And then put that alongside Acts chapter 3, verse 7. It will also give you another uh, insight that he gave attention to medical detail. And then having, having said that, I want you to go to the book of Colossians 4.14. Sister Tina, please read. Colossians 4.14, please. Oh, you don't have your Bible? Okay. Sister Kate, will you please read Colossians 4.14? Colossians 4.14. Okay. okay, good. Thank you. So, I, I didn't quite hear you. You know, somehow, I uh, hear buzzing. Okay? <laughs> but, you know, Colossians chapter 4.14 says, says, Look, the beloved physician. Okay? So, you can be able to see here, put, putting those things, those dots along. Okay? It will tell you that there's no other one qualified, even mentioned, in the scriptures other than Luke, becoming, um, becoming a physician, or a physician. Okay? And, the medical detail that he put together, uh, Luke 8, 43 and Acts chapter 3, verse 7, uh, help us better understand that there's no other author than, than, uh, than Luke himself. And as Paul's traveling companion, he also had access to principal eyewitnesses for chapters, chap uh, for chapters 13 to 28. That's the very reason why you know, he, may he may have not been there per se as to witness exactly what happened, but he had access to this other personal eyewitness. That's why in, in all, you, you notice the work that uh, of all the Gospels, uh, the most concise, the most complete of all of them is the book of Luke. Okay? The way that he detailed them, there are some places where you can be able to, uh, to find things that were written in the book of Luke that you cannot be able to find in other, other Gospels. Okay? But there are also things that you can be able to find in, in the Gospels where you can be able to find in all four of them. But of course, then again, uh, Luke uh, viewed um, the Lord Jesus Christ in, in a different perspective than the other authors of the Gospels. And he viewed the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, okay? the Son of God. Okay? So, do you guys have any questions or any comments as, as we move to the, to the third um, open question that we have? as we try to better understand uh, what the Book of Acts is all about. Anybody? So now, if, if there's no questions, let's now go to the third op open question, which is, when was the Book of Acts written? Okay. When was the Book of Acts written? So again, again, we are uh, trying to cover the uh, survey in this book this morning. The author of the book, and also, the book of Acts nowhere mentions the date for the writing of this document. Okay? We cannot be able to, to see their, uh, an exact date as to where they pinpointed. And uh, in fact, in all of scriptures, you cannot be able to find anybody citing the date. Okay? But the manner that Luke closed the book of Acts would suggest a date. So you cannot be able to, you know, more than likely come, come across a date. But the manner that he closed the book of Acts, you will sort of like get an idea as to when the book of Acts was written. Okay? Now let's now see uh, the ideas that he presents us. Okay? 
If you notice, the end of the, of the book of Acts, which is Acts chapter 28, Luke, the physician, stopped abruptly after he mentioned the duration of Paul's Roman imprisonment. Okay? And where, where is that part? Go to the book of Acts, please. And it is found in verse 28. Chapter 28, verse 30. Okay. Go to the very last chapter. Verse 30. It says, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hard house and received all that came in unto him. Okay. And right now, you can be able to see here that it may not appear that way, but Paul was actually in house arrest. And the Bible says, how long has it been since he was under that condition? The Bible says for two years, two full years. Okay. So, what was happening? Okay. Why was Paul, why was Paul um, there for that long time? Okay. That was actually the time when Paul was waiting for the trial. The first trial that he was supposed to have with Caesar. Okay. And you know, the Roman, the Roman um, Empire and its uh, soldiers, they're actually known for torture. That's one of the, be the best things that, uh, worst things that they're known for is torture. And one of the ways that you can be able to actually torture a man okay, is through incarceration. That's the very reason why, even in our society today, you know, those, you know, you know some people would, would rather uh, be sentenced uh, uh, death than lifetime or triple um, uh, life sentence because they could not bear they could not bear being in jail for that long you know if you remember you know we're we're talking about uh, uh, an example right now let me just give you some examples of people uh, how torturing uh, it was for them to be in prison for a long time and they could not bear lifetime imprisonment. Okay? There was a football player who committed a conspiracy. What he did was he committed a conspiracy by killing one of supposed to be friends. And he tried to cover up his trail. Um, his, his name is um, Hernandez from the New England Patriots. This actually happened, true story, it happened three years ago. And they were able to pin him because of the chewing gum that he, that he spit out in the crime scene. They, was, they were able to draw out his DNA from the chewing gum that, <laughs> the chewing gum that, that he put in his mouth, that spit out, and then the hair strands that came, <laughs> fell off his hair, that got on the guy's clothing. So to make a long story short, you know, judge in New England sentenced him, three life sentenced him. You know, his sentence, did not even last a year when one day they found him that he murdered himself in prison. Okay? He hung himself in prison. Okay? Tall guy, six foot six. See? And the ceiling was no more than no more than seven foot, but somehow he got himself hold of a rope. But they tried to analyze, but they said a lot of psychologists and even those people working with him. That's some idea that he dragged for the longest time was he did not want to stay in prison. He would rather have died okay, uh, or sentence, uh, a death sentence. Okay? But what I'm trying to say here is that that was the reason why, and that's the reason why they sat on Paul's case for the longest time because they wanted to break him. You know, That's one way that they tried to break the spirit of Paul by trying to send him in prison. Okay? So what happened... When, 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 when Paul, uh, when Luke abruptly ended uh, the writing of the book of Acts, Luke mentioned neither the progress of the church, he mentioned ne neither the plans of Paul at all. But it's, it seemed as if Paul or Luke stopped where the history ended. Which means that if we put the dots together okay, as to when when Paul was in prison and then he mentioned he had been there for two years, when did the book of Acts, um, 
when was it written? It would place us, according to history, in AD 62. Okay? AD 62 would be the place, that would be the, the time, because that was the time when, when Paul's trial um, was about to happen. Okay? Because if the book of Acts was written anywhere near after AD 62, okay, then why didn't Luke mention the outcome of Paul's trial? If it was something that was written after then, then he would have mentioned something at least. Or maybe perhaps Luke had a reason why he did not mention this. But his silence may be because Paul has not yet stood before Caesar. And, and Paul did not stand before Caesar until, AD, until after AD 62. Okay? Things to remember why we believe that the book of Acts was not written anything past AD 62, because in AD 64, there's no mention in the book of Acts when Nero um, persecuted the Christians. That did not happen until AD 64, according to history. In AD 63, AD 68, that was the year when Paul died. That was the year that Paul was executed, okay? AD 68. And then in AD 70, that was what, the year when Jerusalem was destroyed. So, it would be safe for us to say that if we put the dots together and the events that were happening, taking into consideration Acts 28.16, as Luke had suggested, then uh, the book of Acts would have been written and uh, completed in the year AD 62. Right? Uh, and um, any other than that, uh, anything other than uh, after AD 62, would, uh, would, be, would there be a, a very, very slim chance? Because of uh, there is no recorded uh, events or details as to uh, uh, when Luke uh, may have included in his narrative. Okay? One last questions, one last question, and then we will end. Any questions or any comments? Do you guys, uh, does it make sense that the Book of Acts uh, would have not been written any anyway near past? 8062 because of the events that, that unraveled after that. Because knowing Luke, um, the way he was and the quality of work that, and the, the way the Holy Spirit inspired him, uh, he would have not missed any details. Okay? He would have not missed any details and he would have included every single thing, especially if there was an outcome uh, related to the, the trial of Paul, especially if... Um, uh, if he mentioned anything about the, the death or the demise of Paul and also the destruction of Jerusalem. Next week, what we'll do is uh, we will study uh, what is the purpose why, why Paul, I mean, why Luke wrote the book of Acts and how we can be able to apply this book in our life. Okay, let's pray. Gracious and loving Father,
morning. Let's all stand as we begin our inspiration.
Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds the hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power through all the universe display. Oh, 
every bird is getting lighter, every cloud is silver light. There the sun is always shining, there no tear will dim the eye. At the ending of the rainbow, where the mountains touch the sky. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand But I know who holds tomorrow And I know who holds my hand Amen Pastor Judas Let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, Lord, we are so grateful, Father, for this time that we can worship you, Lord, together, Lord, in spirit, Lord, and in truth. Thank you, Lord, for protecting us, Lord, on our way here today. Thank you, Lord, also for the blessing that we have received during our, the Sunday school hour, O oh God. Lord, as we continue, Father, Lord, to, uh, to worship thee, Father, may you continue to hasten, Lord, uh, the coming, Lord, of your people, O oh God. And may you also continue, Lord, to prepare our hearts as we listen, Lord, to testimony and the special music, Lord, today. And most importantly, Lord, uh, the word that you would speak, Lord, through our uh, senior pastor today, O oh God. Amen. Lord, may you, Father, Lord, help us, Lord, focus, Lord, on the message today as well as the theme that you have impressed upon our church. How, we, how there is a great need, Lord, for us to stand firm on the truth of the gospel. And uh, thank you, Lord, for... The presence Lord, of each one and we remember also our congregations that are also meeting under the umbrella of IBBC today and those that will be meeting this afternoon that the same blessing that you will give us today will also be Lord manifested in these places yes. thank you Lord for loving us and thank you for giving us your son Jesus Christ once again Lord we give you honor and glory for in Jesus name this is our prayer amen amen, amen. thank you please be seated good morning to all of you how is everyone Amen. Are you ready to worship God? Amen. Amen. Okay. We should, all be, we should all be excited. Amen. Every time we come together as God's people, especially our audience is no other, just the Lord this morning. And I uh, again appreciate your presence this morning. And uh, I'd like you to pray for several people. You know, I, I praise God that uh, those who have been sick the past few days are back with us. At least they can now talk. They stopped barking. Some are still barking. Okay. I tell you, the flu, the strain of flu that's going around uh, this time is really worst kind. I was told that in San Jose area, right, Pastor Julius? Several died already. And uh, a young man died after three days of this flu. You got to be careful. Okay. This strain is really, really very, very bad. I would like you to pray. Uh oh, there you go now. Everybody's now barking. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I would like you to pray for one pastor, Pastor Ray Siciliano. He is only about 50, 50 years old. He, he was pastoring a work, a uh, Filipino work in Los Angeles and went back to the Philippines about three years ago. He is the son of Pastor Juan Siciliano, if you know him. Okay. Well, uh, he just had his angiogram and they found many, many major blockages in his arteries. Both arteries are blocked, 80 to 90 percent, and many arteries uh, other sides are also blocked. He's in the Philippines now, he, you know, uh, uh, he's really worried, uh, and so please pray for him, please pray for his wife as well, okay? Uh, as a person who had gone through that procedure many years ago, almost 20 years ago, by the way, and I'm still alive, amen? And praise God for that, and the 500 plastics, I do understand. The fears that he is actually going through right now. It's, it's, it's scary. You know, he sometimes even, even if you are saved, you know the Lord and you know that you're going to heaven. But the thought of just dying, the thought of not going to wake up after the surgery is something that really can be bother anyone. And I went through that. Okay. And so please pray that God will somehow give him the comfort in his heart. And the willingness to go to the process because without the process, I don't think he'll, he, he will even survive. Okay, so remember Ray Siciliano. Amen? Amen. 
Now also, uh, as, you, as you had noticed in my announcement, we changed the date uh, of our anniversary. You know, I really didn't realize that when I scheduled the anniversary, it's Mother's Day Sunday. When I started inviting pastors, you know, and they just realized, oh, it's Mother's Day and a pastor, I don't think we can leave our church on Mother's Sunday. And several pastors, pastor, I don't think I can leave the church on Mother's Sunday. <laughs> I tell you, we cannot go against the mothers. <laughs> the mothers, the, the mothers are so powerful. And so, uh, and so I said, I said, okay, we, 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 we're going to yield. So we are moving. We have moved our uh, conference to May 23, 25, and our anniversary to May 27. I know it is Memorial Weekend, but uh, I suggest, you know, just stay here on Memorial Weekend. And uh, when I announced that, a lot more people are, are very, very positive because the first day said, Pastor, we couldn't be able to go because it's an examination uh, time in Canada for universities and even high schools. But now we can go. Okay. And besides, it's a more day weekend. We do not need to uh, uh, ask our bosses to give us a break because it's a holiday on Monday. So... Is more beneficial so praise God for that okay so I'd like you to put that in your calendar okay you know we are not going to have any activity on Saturday okay our activity will begin on Wednesday morning the whole day Wednesday morning Thursday and and Friday and Friday and of course we have a special celebration on Saturday on Saturday 26 okay uh, we have some graduates and birthday celebrations we're going to uh, support that and Sunday, of course, is going to be our anniversary. And um, Memorial Day, which is Monday, might, might, might want to uh, uh, put, put another activity there. Okay, maybe allow our ladies to have their own fellowship since the wife of, uh, I, was, I told Pastor Dr. Eric Capace to bring his wife also as well with, uh, with him. So uh, praise God, Eric Capace confirmed his coming. Uh, Dr. David Wood Jr. wanted to come, so he also confirmed his coming, and I praise God for him. I tell you, he's really in support of our, of our ministry, and praise God for that, okay? And uh, don't forget our services tonight, and also this coming Wednesday. I appreciate our men and the ladies who came here and just did some work. We have uh, revived our third uh, Saturday work day. It's not, only, it's not only work day. It's a fellowship day. It's a fun time for everybody to come together and, 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 and just, uh, and, and just uh, do something in the house of the Lord. It's very important. And I really appreciate uh, the leadership of uh, uh, Preacher Aquino. And it was Alice's birthday also yesterday. So we had a wonderful uh, food. Okay. Fed us in, uh, for breakfast and also for lunch. All right. And also congratulations also for... For Sister Tess Calixto, amen. He, she just had a successful, uh, you know, processing of uh, her uh, status here in the U.S. Amen. Okay, now on her way to become a U.S. citizen. Amen. I told her when she becomes a citizen, she is not going to get cold anymore. Amen. All right, you know, she will not get sick anymore. All right. Okay, let's all stand now, please, and let's sing her welcome song. Welcome each one now, shake each one's hands, cross the aisle.
so put on the armor the Lord has provided and place your defense in his unfailing care trust him for he will be with you in battle lighting your path to avoid every snare be strong be strong be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for he is your guide be strong be strong be strong in the Lord and rejoice for the victory is yours thank you take your seats Okay, please pray for Sister Cora Cruz as well. Apparently, she was brought to the emergency yesterday afternoon because of severe arthritis attack. Okay, and also, and also Sister Amber, she is now coming in. Please do pray for her. She will begin her uh, uh, dialysis, okay, this month, all right? So we have a lot of people in need of our prayers, okay? Good morning to everyone. Uh, this morning I'm going to give a testimony, testimony of what happened last uh, weekend when me and uh, Preacher Roland went to uh, uh, Edmonton and Calgary. It was, uh, it was a very uh, good experience. It, it was a blessing to be over there and to see the work uh, in Edmonton uh, and, and the, the condition. Uh, we left uh, last Friday at uh, 5.50 a.m. And uh, we arrive, uh, we have a layover, we have a layover in Seattle. And it's funny thing that in Seattle, from Seattle to Edmonton, we, uh, um, we, we, uh, we, we took a plane with, a, it's like, it's not a jet, it's a, it's a propeller, you know. <laughs> it's it's kind of scary. It's so noisy. And then uh, there's, we don't have the shade going to the airplane, you know? And it's raining outside, so we went outside, it's raining. And <laughs> what kind of uh, plane is this? <laughs> we are exposed to the rain. And then they took our, you know, took our baggages because the baggages, that they don't fit into the, into the closet uh, on top, you know? <laughs> so we didn't know where our baggage will be going, so. Uh, so, uh, but then uh, they showed up uh, when we went out, when we arrived at Edmonton, our baggage just showed up in the baggage screen. So, <laughs> praise God for that. And we arrived uh, at Edmonton at about 12.30, something like almost one. And then when, uh, it's not really, you know, um, you know the, the news that it was very, very cold over there, although it's negative, you know, it's negative like eight, negative seven. Celsius, not uh, Fahrenheit. Um, I prepared, you know, I prepared my jacket, a very thick jacket. It's heavy too. I, I, I bought leggings. I bought uh, my uh, shoes, you know. <laughs> Every, I, I prepared everything. And then when, I came, when we came there, it's not really cold. <laughs> it's negative because you only, you only go out once. You know, you go to the car, it's warm. You go to the house, it's warm. And then the, per, uh, the night that we slept, I was, I was actually sweaty, you know. <laughs> I was actually sweaty. So anyway, that's what, that was a good experience. And um, in, during the nighttime when we fellowship with uh, Sister Brenda, the, sis, the sister of uh, Richard Hernan, um, Richard Hernan and Sister Brenda were the ones in charge uh, of the Edmonton um, uh, missions uh, during the time when Preacher Hernan is in, is in Edmonton. But now um, he's back to uh, Montreal and, and it, it is Sister Brenda who is taking care of the ministry there. So, and also Sister Linda, Sister Linda, the, the owner of the house, is, was not there. He was in the Philippines. So we were the only ones in the house. And then from Sister Brenda, 
uh, we, we, have, we have known the condition of the church there. It needs a preacher. Needs a, the, uh, the missions need some preacher, a regular preacher, and it needs some, some financial help. You know. Sister Brenda poured her heart, her heart to us, you know, because we, um, uh, we, we have been to a prayer, and he's, he, uh, she's crying, you know, she's crying. And, uh, and she used all her finances to, you know, support the ministry. And he had this, he incurred some credits, something like that, to support the ministries. So I urge you and encourage you to support. And I, and I, I want to uh, recommend to Pastor that we support financially. The, because we are not supporting the yeah. ministry there since, uh, in, uh, since the time when uh, Peter Hernan w went to Montreal. So we have to support. So. Uh, we, we were, uh, you know, when we left, there's this gift that, uh, there's this gift that they still give, you know, they give to the preachers. I said, take it, take it. And then I said, no, no, you take the, the gift. So I took the gifts, okay? Okay, I'll, let me take the gifts and then I'll send. So I can send it back to the, uh, the mission church. Uh, so I urge you to, you know, encourage you to support. Let's support this uh, mission church. It needs some finances. By the way, Sister Brenda was, uh, was a graduate of medicine in the Philippines. She was a graduate of medicine. Canada. Yeah. She's practicing. Yeah, um, yeah and, and, and she's, I think she's not yet practicing. I don't know if she's practicing, but she, she fin finished all the certifications that are needed to become a doctor in Canada. And, and she's asking us, I'm, am I going to pursue this? She said, or I, I'm, I'm just going to concentrate to the ministry. We encourage her to, to pursue it, you know, at the same time uh, serve in the ministry. So that's what we have known. And it's really, a, it's a blessing to know that. We had this con long conversation with her during the, the afternoon. Then the next day, we went to, we, we had a long drive to uh, uh, Calgary. It's about uh, 100, uh, 186 miles away, you know, and it's about three hours, three hour drive. So everything is in metric, so you got, got to drive 110 kilometers an hour or something like that. So Preacher Roland didn't, dri didn't drive 110, he drove like 120. <laughs> because you are allowed, I think you <laughs> allowed 10. And then um, everything left and right of the road is so white. And there are no houses. There are no houses. There are no houses. So, it was a, it was a good drive though, and uh, I let Preacher Roland drive because he, uh, he has a more uh, better reflex than I am. Okay. Right. And so that's the next day we arrived. We left 9:30 and we arrived at Calgary at one o'clock. Then we arrived at the house uh, of one pump. You know, everybody is gone. I mean, I mean the. They visited some relatives in Boston, in the Philippines. Some went home to the Philippines. So we just had one family uh, left in the house, the owner of the house. And, and the name is Fidel. You know, right? Fidel, you remember? Fidel, those who went over there. And then Preacher Roland uh, held a Bible study, held a Bible study there. And he, uh, he, um, he taught the fellowship, fellowship, the, the ones that uh, were written by our pastor, you know. And then uh, uh, he uses gadgets. You know, the first time that uh, Preacher Roland uses small toys, you know, you have, you have seen the one that he's bringing with him, the small, uh, you know, uh, projector and a boss uh, sound, where, where the sound comes from. Uh, and it's, it's pretty good, and they like it. And then at the end of the fellowship um, uh, Bible study, uh, there's this test. And there's this, uh, the, the, daughter, the daughter and uh, the two daughters of Fidel um, are, are, are there. The wife is not there because she worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, the two daughters are active in participating in the, in the Bible study, especially the small one, Ruth. The name is Ruth, and the, the, the one that, who is working is uh, Nicole. And at the end, uh, we, we have fun in answering the 
the questions on the fellowship. And then we, after that, we went to uh, the other house, um, uh, uh, the family um, of Gilbert, you know, you know Gilbert uh, and, and Grace, I think Vasquez, who were uh, originally from, uh, from the Middle East and they uh, went to Canada. Uh, I think they were under uh, Pastor Benny's uh, church. Uh, that's what I, I heard. And then, and then I, I held a Bible study there on, on prayer, on prayer. And then we left, we left at about seven o'clock, it's already dark. And then here's the problem. We didn't notice when we, when we came back to Edmonton from Calgary, we didn't notice the, the our headlights are covered with mud, you know, <laughs> you know. If you, if you drive over there, you'll, you'll notice the cars are dirty, you know, dirty, uh, very dirty. I thought that there's only one car that's dirty that we're following. And then when we look, oh, oh, you see, the cars are all dirty. It's because of the mud on the road, you know, it's flying all over. Then when we came back, we didn't notice our headlights are covered with mud. So we, we drove. And then we are follow, following. When we are following somebody, we can see the road. But when we are alone, we can't see the road because what happened? You know, our lights are not working. So I told Tracy Roland to uh, to pull over on the side, but he, he doesn't want to follow. <laughs> he wants to get off the road. He wants to get off the road and find a, and find a, a, a gasoline station. There are no gasoline stations in the on the long uh, the long roads. <coughs> So he finally followed me, and then we found out that the headlights are covered with mud. So we, we washed them, and it is good that we are bringing water with us. And he uses handkerchief. The handkerchief is not enough to wipe off the mud on the headlight. So we use some, some tissues that, that, that uh, Sister Benda is bringing with her. So uh, finally, we saw the road. You know, we have a bright light. Then we arrive, we arrive at the... We arrive in Edmonton at 11 o'clock in the evening. So it's a, you know, late already. And then, then the next day, we, um, you know, it's Sunday, so we held our uh, regular, like a regular uh, uh, service. We, I taught again the, in the Sunday school. But, uh, there, there were only uh, how many people who came? Uh, uh, Romel, you know. Romel came, and then there's this other lady which is just uh, living by uh, a, walk, a, a, a few distance uh, house away. And then the, a couple by the name of Nico, Nico and Garcia. Yeah. I, I cannot even pronounce her name, so I just put in my mind, I'll just remember lasagna and I'll remember your name. <laughs> <laughs> So they were there, and they were they were the ones who are. Um, uh, one is the worship leader, Nico. We allow him to, you know, and then the other one is the pianist. So I thought, <laughs> I thought, uh, the uh, Sunday school and preacher Roland preached, uh, did the preaching. So it was a it was a blessing, you know. It was yeah. a blessing and to be there. It was a good experience. I'll come. I'll I'll come back there again, yeah. you know. But I'll be, I should be with somebody. <laughs> I cannot uh, be there alone. And uh, you know, I encourage all uh, preachers who haven't haven't been gone there yet and experienced uh, being, you know, a part of the ministry there. It need, it need, it really needs a preacher, and it needs support. It needs support. So that's the, the thing that we have found there. And uh, praise God that uh, we went there being a, a mission task force director. I see the need, uh, see the need financially. And uh, so that's, that's our, when we came back, by the way, we, uh, there's a bad news when we came back that again, we rode, we rode this turbo, turbo type plane. And then, and we were worried about our, about our baggages because when we went inside the plane, a lady just took our bags and without saying anything, you know. <laughs> and so that, and then when we went to Seattle, our baggage, our baggage just didn't show up in the baggage claim. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, uh, Preacher Roland is already discouraged because uh, he, he has these gadgets, you know, that we use and almost worth like a thousand inside the, in, inside his uh, 
bag, including the other things in there. For me, it's just the clothes, you know. But the, val the valuable thing that I'll be losing are just my keys. They can be, they can be uh, reproduced, but uh, so uh, I, I didn't have a heavy heart, you know. I don't know why I didn't have a heavy heart when, uh, when even the baggage didn't show. So we just went up, went, went and go ahead and took the plane to Auckland. And when we were in Auckland, we thought of uh, going to the baggage claim office, office, and then. And then we talked to the person, and they were so nice, you know, the lady and the, the man, they were so nice, and they, they, they told, they gave us some forms to fill up and describe our, uh, uh, describe the things that are inside our baggages. So, so submitted that, and then, you know, the next day they were calling, and then our baggages are ready. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And then they, they uh, and then in the night, our baggages came, and they delivered them, they delivered them. So we were glad that it it happened and praise God for that. Amen. So everything went well. So thank you and um, we'll be going back there again. Praise God. Your love loose my chains, and in you I am free. But Jesus brought me, and Jesus said.
Praise God for that man's ministry. Uh, let's welcome this morning uh, the Estasio family, the, uh, the son-in-law and the daughter of uh, Brother Roland and Sister Des. Please stand up there. Amen. Good to see them. Good morning. All right. All right. Thank you for visiting with us today. And uh, this time I would like to request um, Brother Ezekiel and Brother Gabriel to please come and help us with the ushering. As we have our operatory, let's all stand, please. Uh, giving is a part of our worship in this church. If you're not a member in this church, you're not obliged to give. And I would like to request Pastor Francis to lead us with our scripture reading. And then pray with the offering. Pray for the offering. John chapter 4, verses 7 to 14. John chapter 4, verses 7 to 14. The Bible says... There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that being a Jew asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. Shall we pray? Our gracious loving Father, we're so thankful for uh, the opportunity for us to come together and worship you. Thank you, dear God, for your goodness and your mercy in our life. In spite of our unfaithfulness and inconsistencies, Lord, you're gracious and kind, loving, forgiving, and always ready to restore. I pray that you help us, Lord, as we give our part of all the wonderful blessings and uh, your benevolence, Lord, in our life. Lord, we thank you for the great salvation and all that you have given us uh, materially. And Lord, uh, everything, Lord, um, are from you. And we recognize all of that. And in this small token, Lord, to give back, I pray that you help us that we might have the heart and cheerfully give, Lord, what is due. And I pray that we will Lord, uh, help that we will give it, Lord, wholeheartedly, not grudgingly, uh, that thou mayest, Lord, be glorified and magnified. And might thy, thy blessing be upon, Lord, uh, this gift. And help us as your people, Lord, to be faithful in our giving, to prove ourselves to you, for you have said, Lord, uh, you will open the windows of heaven, where there shall not be room enough to receive the blessings once we prove ourselves to you. I pray that you challenge our heart, Lord, in this area of giving. And may you use this for the furtherance of the gospel. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I obey you, Lord, the master of my soul. Yielding my will to keep my tights and all. Forsaking self to follow your command. And obey you, Lord, and obey you, Lord. I honor you, my King, my Deliverer. For the cross you bore, your blood and eternal life. Accept my gift to live your name up to the world. With this increase, I honor you. My loving Father, thank you for the things you do, the love you show, your grace and your mercy too. I offer you the first fruits of my labor to thank you, to thank you. I worship you, my God, oh Lord, I praise you. Yeah. I magnify your name, express my love for you with my life and all I 
my sacrifice for you. I worship you. I worship you. Just remain standing as I call Dr. Christian Simeon to lead us with our Bible pledge before we hear the choir. Grab your Bibles and uh, recite the, the pledge. This is my Bible. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It tells me who I am, what I'm become, where I'm, where I'm going. It renews my mind, changes my heart, and refreshes my soul. It's my daily bread. By faith, I will believe its promises, obey its commandments, and honor its principles in my life. The Bible is my guide. I walk by faith and not by sight. Please be seated. Choir comes. So good morning. The choir will be singing today a special song. This would be an introduction of our theme song, which is titled Standing Firm on the Truth of the Gospel. Based on our theme here, uh, Standing Firm on the Truth of the Gospel, 2 Timothy. <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. So, and this is composed by our, none other than by our pianist, Sister Rexella Salonga. So, please try to join us and learn the song. The, the, the lyrics will be flashed in the projector. So, sing with us if you may. But, uh, yeah, this is the introduction.
Thank you very much, choir, and thank you very much, Rixella, for that beautiful song. Okay, we're going to be learning that song, which will be our uh, theme song, okay, in the year 2018, all right? You know, what, uh, let's try the chorus, all right? Is that the chorus part? Okay, so you go ahead and take your seat, choir, and just guide us through, okay, and sing with me here, all right? Just the chorus. Wow. Can we get the words? Okay, please take your seat. Okay, let's all stand up, please. Let's all stand. Let's sing. This is the way. Okay. Where? Where? He's standing. He's standing. He's standing firm. On the word, standing firm. I trust the gospel. Back up. Back it up. Back it up, please. Uh, the one before that. One more. There. Yeah, okay, ready? Standing firm on the truth of the gospel. Standing firm on the truth of God's word. There is only one true gospel. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, standing firm on the truth of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Thank you. Beautiful song, I tell you. Rexella is really is, uh, improving as a, uh, not only as a pianist, but also as a composer. Amen. Praise God for that. I'd like to encourage those who can uh, uh, make songs and compose songs to uh, go ahead. I remember Rexella when, when she was just a young lady in the Philippines. I first met her there, okay, and then she came here as her pianist, and she has grown, okay. And, of course, uh, France, Francis, I don't know if Pastor Francis has something to do with this, but uh, I really appreciate that. Our text today is in the book of Romans, so I'll be covering the whole book the whole chapter of Romans chapter 8, but let me just read to you one verse, okay, to begin. In verse 1, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, you can remain seated, all right? And it says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. Thank you again, our God, that... Uh, uh, we can be here together, O oh Lord, to worship you and to commune one with another, O oh God, in unity, O oh Lord, and to thank you for all your goodness. And uh, as a church, O oh God, to be reminded, O oh God, of uh, the opportunity and the privileges you have given to us, O oh God, as your people. And the family represented here, we pray for those who are not here as well, for those who are sick. We pray for those, O oh God, who are traveling. Again, I pray that you bless us and talk to us, O oh God, through your message this morning. We give you all the praises and all the glory in Christ's name. We ask all these things. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like you to also pray for uh, Preacher Jerome. Preacher Jerome is ministering to his family in North Virginia. I don't need to, uh, to tell the details of it, but uh, there's a concern about his brother. Okay. And I've, uh, I've spoken to Pastor uh, uh, Jericho Tumang about this. And we would like to be able to really get the whole family to come to our church there. Amen. Maybe, perhaps, this will be a good opportunity for us to get to, to reach out to uh, Cervantes family in North Virginia, for them to uh, uh, be settled in our church in North Virginia, uh, Pastor Tumang's church. So praise God for that. You know what? We carry the gospel, the good news. Amen? Just like what I said, we ought not only be carrying the good news and sharing them. We ought to living the, be living the gospel. And it's true. I really appreciate uh, Preacher uh, Jun Luxina and Preacher, uh, uh, you, you know, Roland going to Edmonton. And they went there with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They went there with the opportunity to share that wonderful news. I also appreciate Brenda, Brenda, who is a medical doctor, you know, a, a, a young woman. And she's even willing to let go of her profession just to focus on the ministry. You know, I really, I really admire that woman, she was with me in Montreal, and she was crying. She would come to the front, and uh, you know, just so 
just, just so passionate on what she's doing for the Lord. And she also asked me the same question. Pastor, am I going to pursue my medical career? I said, you know, God has blessed you with that opportunity. Pursue that. Because I believe God is going to use you greater, you know, a lot more in the ministry as a medical doctor. But she cared. Why? Because she believes she carries. And she's living the gospel. You know what? If you believe that you have the gospel, if you believe that you carry the gospel, you're going to be so careful, amen, in living your life. So as not to destroy or to misrepresent the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have so many people out there hurting. So many people out there crying. Wanting hope. Opportunities. That only the Lord Jesus Christ can give. And guess what? We have been recipients of this blessed gospel. If you are saved this morning. If there was a time in your life in which you came to know Christ your Savior, you've been, you've been forgiven, amen? You know, you have surrendered, that means God has chosen you. And because God has chosen you, then you ought, we ought to carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ responsibly, amen? With the full knowledge of the Savior, just like what I said. You cannot separate the gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this chapter... Romans chapter 8 is one of the most amazing and precious passages of the word of God. Why? It declares the power of the gospel through the Lord Jesus Christ. As opposed to what the law can do. Most religious, religions like the old Jewish faith teach that a people must perform, must submit, must do what the law declares. And that's good. I believe we need to follow the law. Amen. But you need to understand the law cannot save us. Even how much you follow the law, the law cannot save you. And this expectation brings eternal frustrations to people. Because no one can really and fully satisfy the demands of the law. And no one can fulfill the law. The law states that if you are guilty of one, then you are guilty of all. That's how frustrating it can be. But praise God, Jesus Christ is the good news. Amen? Because, because He does not tell us to obey the law. He does not. He only tells us to follow Him and to set Himself as an example to us. Why? Because He is the one we ought to follow. We all need to put our trust in Him who already has fulfilled the law for us. Through Christ, the demands of the law was accomplished. What man could not do, Christ did. What the law could not offer, the gospel did. In doing this, the Apostle Paul enumerates here, I believe in Romans chapter 8, the blessedness, the blessedness of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I went to Montreal. One of the things that actually confronted me, uh, 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 Brother June came and approached me and said, you know, Pastor, you know, we have a family here who just came from Toronto. And I believe, and I believe this, this, this woman is not only having any difficulty or any, any illness. I believe this woman is possessed by demons. And he was just living above his house. And so I said, well, you know, I need to see her. I need to see the family. Okay, and I'm willing to be able to, uh, uh, to help. And, and, and for this woman to, uh, uh, to be able to know the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior. And of course, you know, uh, when, when, I, when I spoke to the family and spoke to this woman, I realized that he, she was that actually uh, possessed by the demons. You could tell if one is possessed by demons. When one is possessed by demons, that, that, that person becomes another personality. Okay? That person becomes another person, not herself. I mean, the, the power is so different. The manifestations are so powerful. And so I said... I don't think she is possessed. But it appears that she is being oppressed. And apparently they, they, they want the different uh, people in Toronto, even in Montreal. They sought help from Catholic priests, from different religions, from, from Pentecostal preachers and all those kind of things. You know, So I started, uh, I, I started talking to her and prayed with her and advised her. And for some reason this woman, this woman you know, did, uh, did not react to me adversely. 
Okay, she was really very compliant to me by the grace of God. Okay, and apparently at one time in her life, she received Christ as her Savior. And she was saying that she was hearing a lot of voices. She was, uh, she was hearing voices that, that, that would tell her to do some crazy things and bad things. And she, she said the devil is attacking her almost every day. And that's, uh, that, that's oppression to me. There are three ways a person can be attacked by demons. One is possession, one is oppression, and one, another one is obsession. And so we prayed for her. The family prayed for her. And before I left, the family again said, you know, Pastor, can you meet her again? Because they're now, they will soon be moving back to Toronto, and she wants to talk with you again. When I came back, you know what? She was smiling already. There's a big change in her life. Amen? And the family was so grateful that IABC Montreal, that your pastor there could be able. It's not because of my power. Amen? It's just because of the privileges God has given to me. That the power of God can set free anybody as long as that person puts his trust or a trust not on anybody but on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you see, we have that gospel. And if you do not, if you do not yield to the gospel and use the gospel for the right reason, there's no way for us to help people. See? You know what? There's a great blessedness. In this text about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to we'll see that one, each one of them. I can be able to really finish this message to you this morning. But I believe just uh, sharing, sharing with you one of them I think is wonderful. It's wonderful. It's, uh, it will, will fully help us in understanding you know, what the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is. In the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 1 to 4. It's a read. Beginning from verse 1 it says there is therefore now no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What I can see in this passage is this. That the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has given us that blessed assurance of the righteousness of Christ in us. In other words, that we ought not to anymore live in sin. We ought not to anymore feel defeated. We ought not to anymore be scared of condemnation. Because through the Lord Jesus Christ and through his saving grace, amen, and through his power, God has lifted that condemnation away from us, amen. He first took away the condemnation in Greek word katakrina, which indicates that we are not servants to the power and penalty of sins anymore. Huh? You know, the, but that guilt and penalty have been removed at the cross. So therefore, when you put your trust in the Savior, God had taken, had taken from you the penalty of sin. Amen. God had taken from you also the, 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 the power and, and through his sanctifying grace, he will also take you the power of that sin. Yes, you can say no to sin. Yes, you can be able to overcome sin, to overcome temptation. Why? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of of his gospel. As a child of God. We do not live under the constant threat. Of judicial punishment. Of God. Amen. You know we ought not anymore. We ought not to be guilty anymore. I was talking to a person who still feels guilty. And I said why do you feel guilty? Aren't you saved? Have you received Christ your Savior? You know Pastor I did. Then why feel guilty? You are not guilty anymore. Well the reason why you are guilty. Is because you have not confessed your sins. See, you still commit sins every day. Keep on committing sins every day. That's why you feel guilty. But the Bible says, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, we can get rid of that guilt because Christ has gotten rid of that guilt for us as well. Oh, the principle, the principle of sin and death no longer has a dominion over us. Because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. As it says in verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Jesus had made me free. From the law of sin and death. See. You know. 
Of course, it does not mean that the believer is free from sin or from their prospect of death. We are still, we are still going to experience death, possibly, okay? You know, unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes immediately. See, we will still sin, but it's because we still live in this vile body. But despite that, God has given us the power to overcome that. See? See, the sin and death, that they do not anymore have control over us. Because we are not protected by the Holy Spirit. Now look at John chapter 3, verses 18 to 19. John chapter 3, verses 18 to 19. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Amen? If you believe on him, you are no longer condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. See? There's nothing in a natural man that he can do in order for him to be condemned. Amen? A man does not need to do anything for him to be condemned. The soonest he is born, a man is born, he is already condemned. Okay, now don't believe in that doctrine that says, well, you're condemned when you become uh, a mature individual. Well, a baby is, uh, is not, no. As soon as we are born, we are condemned already. Why? Because of the nature that is in us. Amen? But praise God. But praise God does not render, render those babies to be guilty of sin. You know, without reaching the age of accountability. I believe in that. That's why babies are not saved. They're safe. There's a big difference between S-A-V-E and S-A-F-E. See? When a baby does not reach the age of accountability. The time, you know, of truly knowing what is right and wrong. He is safe. In God's protection. He is not condemned to hell. See? But when he then goes into the age of accountability. He begins to understand what is right and what is wrong. Then he becomes responsible. He becomes accountable to God. And when he dies. Knowing that. He is condemned already. Now that's why we need to reach out even to the young people. We need to reach out even to the children. Amen. Even to, to the elementary you know, uh, school children. About, about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They need the gospel. When I was a child. You know, I, was, uh, I was reached with the gospel in the wrong way. Because I, somebody scared me to get saved. You know I realized that you do not scare people to be saved. I realize that when you share the gospel, you need to share the good news, not the scary news. I don't believe in that scary. I don't believe that you ought to scare people to be saved. It's not going to work because it's not a gospel anymore. I tell you, when I was a child, people were telling me, if you're not going to receive Christ, you're going to hell. I got scared of that. I wanted to be saved, not because I want to receive Christ. I wanted to be saved because I wanted to get rid of hell. Because I didn't want to go to hell. Oh, that scared me. I couldn't sleep in the, in, in the evening. I begged my mom, you know, and I, 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 I don't want to go to hell. How can I go to heaven? Please, you know, don't make me go to hell. Why well, receive Christ? I receive Christ. And yet, when I was growing up, I still have that doubt in my heart. Until I realize that, that, that salvation of the Lord Jesus is so precious. It's not focused on condemnation. It's focused on the love of God. When I realize the love of God. When I realize the grace of God. When I realize the justice of God. That's when I understood the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the, the gospel is good news. Amen. Now, if you're, going to go, if you're going to continue reading in John 3, 18, it says, He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at verse 19. And this is the condemnation. Look, what is the condemnation? 
In, according to verse 19. Now look, in verse 19, the condemnation is not a place. The condemnation is not the place called hell. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world that men love darkness rather than light. That's the condemnation. See? The condemnation is not just the idea of going to hell. That's the result of condemnation. The condemnation is the, the fact that if you are not saved, you are in darkness. That if you are not saved, you are not in light. That you, if you are not saved, what is in your mind, what is in your heart is always evil. It's always bad. Then even if you think good, you are not thinking good. It's like what it says in the book of Isaiah. Your righteousness becomes as filthy rags. That's what a condemnation is. That nothing in you is good. See? You know, sometimes you only think of the condemnation as going to hell. But that's not the condemnation it says here. What is the condemnation it says here? And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love this. Rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let me ask you this. Those of you who claim to be saved today. Those who, well, who claim to love the Lord. Do you love light more than darkness? Or do you love darkness more than light? Are you men still full of the deeds of evil or deeds of righteousness? In other words, maybe you're still condemned. That's the question I ask myself. I said, Lord, I received you when I was six years old because I was so scared of hell. How come when I was 17 years old, I was still scared? I, mean, I was still very scared to die. Until I realized my condemnation that my deeds were still evil, my desires were still evil. I was still very disobedient to God. When I was in the church, my mind was not there. Amen? I was so disrespectful of my parents. I was trying to pat myself on the back. Oh, that's okay, you're saved because you spread sinners' prayer. But within my heart, I'm still condemned because my deeds were still evil. Now look. Now if you tell me you're saved and you're still thinking of evil in your minds, disrespecting your parents, being disobedient and being rebellious to God, so that even if you're in the church, your mind is away from the church, then you are still condemned. Maybe you're not saved. Who are you fooling? God? No, yourself. Because if you die today, then the outcome of that condemnation is eternal death. The result of that condemnation is eternal death. But the Bible says, if you're saved, you are no longer condemned because you know what? What is in your mind is righteousness. God is within you. The spirit is within you. And even if you don't want to be in the church, you love the church. Even if you want to disrespect your parents, you don't want to because within yourself you know there's Holy Spirit that's speaking to you. Now look, if there's no one speaking to you to do the right thing, maybe you are still condemned. Think about yourself today. You know, salvation is not just saying a prayer. It is not just Going to heaven. Salvation is not. It's a, it's a life of not feeling condemned anymore. You know that truth. Has made my life. A lot easier. Oh yes. I still sin against God. There are times. I still don't want to do the things of the Lord. But when I think of God, there's still always a still small voice. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. And I always, I always listen and obey that still small voice. Why? Because I am no longer condemned. I am no longer a slave of sin. 
I am no longer a slave of the power of sin. I want you to think about you this morning. Do you have power to say no to those kind of things? Search your heart if you are still in the faith. Search your heart if you're really a child of God. If you're really saved. There's a story about this young man many years ago. I heard his story as an older man now, as a pastor of the church. And he said, you know, he said, when I was younger, when I was young, I was so proud. I moved to Hollywood because I wanted to be an actor. I knew I could be an actor. And he showed his handsome face picture. Yeah, indeed. Artist in talaga. So he went to Hollywood, lived in Hollywood. But he was saved. He was struggling about his faith and the world. He surrendered his life to the ministry. But he totally had forsaken the ministry and forsaken God. You know, one thing about a person who's truly saved, yes, yeah, sometimes you can still forsake God. But you know what? You're going to live miserable, miserable life. So he went to Hollywood. He wanted to pursue his own. And one time he went to the church. For the last time he went to the church. And the pastor said, if you're here this morning and you're rebel, you're, 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 you're rebelling against God and you know what God wants you to do and you rebel against God, there will come a time that you're going to learn your lesson. And I was still so proud. Well, you know, who is you to tell me that? I am going to, I'm here in Hollywood. I'm going to become an actor. That week, he was on his way to, uh, uh, to go to uh, a place for, uh, uh, I guess, getting a sh uh, having, having, having a shoot, right? Okay. He started driving his brand new car because he was all, all the earning money. Guess what happened? His car hit a tree. Burned the car. Totally damaged Guess what damage? His face. In the hospital, I realized, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He woke up, scarred face. But you know what? That did him much good. Because because of that, he went back to the Lord. He became a preacher. He even became a person who started a Bible college program in Los Angeles that actually allowed many Christians to graduate. The Pacific Coast Baptist College many years ago. Amazing testimony. What is the lesson of that example? You know, sometimes God allows us to live, live the life according to how we want to live our life. But if God is, but, God, but, if, but if, you really, if you really save, God is going to teach us a lesson. And the lesson is not going to be good. What God is telling us to change and to learn And to get right, let us learn. Let us change and get right. Because as a believer, God has given us the power to learn, to say no to sin, and to live right. Because God has already taken away that condemnation. On the other hand, if you don't have the power to say no, 
but are the dictates of sin. So much so that you remain to be disobedient and rebellious and rejecting God, maybe you're still condemned. Maybe you still need to be saved. Now, I'm not questioning your salvation here. You just want to be sure whether or not we are in the faith. That's why it says in verse 9, this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, it says in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. You know what? When God has saved me, when God has saved you and me, God has placed on you his robe of righteousness. Amen? He has imputed in us his robe of of righteousness so that now in the eyes of the father you are righteous because of God's robe of the, the robe of righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ placed on you the father is not anymore seeing the sin that in you what the father is seeing is what the Lord Jesus Christ his righteousness that he imputed in your life but you see, if you're not really saved, you don't have that righteousness. You don't. There's another wonderful blessedness of the gospel. Can you imagine? Who, who am I to even be counted worthy to be called righteous? Is anybody here righteous? Nobody here is righteous. But praise God, we are now righteous because of Jesus. Amen. We are righteous because of his power. That's why we can truly say, I am saved forevermore. Amen. I am righteous forevermore. Even if I still sin, I am righteous. And you guess what, you know? It's like what I said, you know, I don't believe, I don't believe in God because, you know, uh, because if, if, if you, because I was told if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not going to have fun anymore. You realize that's the problem with most of most young people today? I don't want to believe in Jesus because it's no more fun. I cannot have fun with my friends anymore. Who tells you that? I don't have any more joy. That's why a lot of young people, a lot of young ones, they get away from the church. They don't want to do the right things. Why? Because they're afraid they're going to lose the fun. That's not true. In fact, the Bible says if you're in Christ, you have the joy in your heart. The joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, Christianity it's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. That's the law. You realize in heaven, there's no law in heaven. There's no law in heaven that says, don't do this, do that. You cannot find any, any, any signs in heaven. When you go there, oh, don't do this, you can only do that. Nothing like that in heaven. Why? Because there's only one law in heaven. It's the law of love. And the law of righteousness. Because God's love is in my heart. I don't need to be told what to do and what not to do. Because Jesus is the one who controls me. So therefore, therefore whatever I do is all righteousness. Whatever I think is all right. There's no laws in heaven anymore. The true church of God, there's no law. Don't be scared of the church. Somebody told, I don't want to go to church because you have all the... No. Do you find any do's and don'ts here? Because if you only obey God, 
and leave the Lord. You are not controlled by any law. Amen? You are only controlled by the law if you are disobeying it. You know, I learned that driving. When the speed limit is 50 miles an hour, and I drive less than 50 miles an hour, I feel safe and comfortable. I don't have any problem. Well, I'm speed. I'm not speeding. You know, that's their problem. I'm not speeding. But guess what? If you, if you drive 51, 52, 60, 65, what do you feel? Guilty. Why? Because you know you're not doing right. So when does the law control you? When? When you obey? No. When do you become under the law? When you obey? No. You become under the law when you disobey. If you don't disobey, the law is not above you. That's what it means there. That's why as a Christian, we can always enjoy God. We can have fun. Amen? We're going to have beauty. Why? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I can only deal with one, with the first one today. But I hope this truth will be good enough for you to chew upon. Are you still condemned? Are you now saved? Think about your heart today. Let's all stand, please. Let us pray. We stand, bow our heads, and close your eyes. And think about what I said. I'd like to ask our soul winners to go and speak to our visitors. Again, I'm not here to scare you. I want her to give you the good news. And the good news is the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is a person who takes away condemnation. The Lord Jesus Christ forgives. He is our joy. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior. He always just wants us to enjoy Him. He loves you. But he does not want you to remain in condemnation. Still controlled by the power of sin. And the threat of eternal punishment. All your heads are bowed and eyes closed. I want you to ask you this important question. How many of you can really say with your raised hand, you know, Pastor? Especially our young people. I firmly believe, Pastor, I'm no longer condemned. Oh, yes, I still have temptation. But I know I have the power to say no to temptation. I know. I am no longer condemned. And because of that, I know I'm saved. How many of you can really say that in your heart? Would you raise your hands? Yes. Amen. Who else? How many of you can, you really, can really declare that? Oh, yes, Pastor, I still have temptations. But when they come, sometimes I fall into it. But uh, I realize I have the power to say no. Because I still have the love of God in my heart. I still want to do what is right. I'm not those people who are totally condemned. Anybody else? Yes, amen. And that, that's good. That shows you're totally saved. But how many of you here can say, you know, Pastor, I have a problem. When I go through temptations, I'm having difficulty. Sometimes I can overcome it. I cannot say no to it. Pastor, help me. I don't want to be condemned. All heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? 
Would you raise your hand? Yeah. Okay. If that's your life today, and you're saying, Pastor, I don't have the power to overcome. That means you really need to be saved. If that's your condition this morning, as other people also come and pray, I'd like to give this opportunity for those of you who are saved, totally saved, then why don't you thank God for that blessedness that God has given to you. Then you come to the altar and pray, thank God for that. Would you do that? If you're truly saved, and you're not condemned anymore, thank God. But if in your heart you know that you still have that condemnation, then you come forward also. You need to come forward also. Anybody else? Our gracious Father, thank you, O Lord, for the truth that you have given to us this morning. It's true about what you said, O oh God, truth shall make us free. But we need to accept the truth, apply the truth, in order for us to enjoy the truth. Thank you, O Lord, that you've given us the power to overcome. The power to say no to sin. And because of the power of the Holy Spirit, O God, then we can totally declare that you've taken away the condemnation from us. Because even with the temptation, with the thoughts of sin, we can hear the still small voice. We can obey the still small voice. And do the right thing. But I want to pray for others, O oh Lord. Just like my experience in the past. And they're the, they're the only ones who know it. Because if they don't have the power if they don't hear the still small voice, oh God. To obey. I pray, oh Lord, that they will realize, oh God, that you have the answer. That the power is in you. And I pray for them. That you release them, O oh God, from the power of the darkness. And I pray, O oh God, that those of us here, O oh Lord, who have been recipients of the good news. That we will carry and live that good news. Because there are many out there, O oh God, seeking for answers. Hopeless, waiting for hope. May we take that opportunity and the blessedness, oh God, and the privilege. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Christ's name. We ask all these things. Amen. God bless you. I'd like to call um, a couple of ushers, please, to, to come. Uh, Brother Ezekiel, please come. And, and Preacher Bert. Um, we have our second offering. This gives an opportunity for 
our church members who missed the operatory to return what belongs to the Lord. Let's go ahead and, and pray for the second offering. Gracious and loving Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the message, Father, Lord, that we have heard today. Thank you, Lord, also for the opportunity, Lord, that we can be able to uh, return what belongs to you so that, Lord, our church, Lord, can further um, and reach, Lord, not only our community, but the uttermost part of the world and the neighboring places. Bless us now, Lord, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. dollars in tithes. Uh, on Sunday morning, we had um, over 4000 which is $4,004 to be exact. That was our offering uh, as far as tithes is concerned last Sunday. And uh, we thank the Lord also for the, uh, the four professions of faith that uh, we had yesterday. Uh, this is uh, held at the, uh, the Bible study group that is being um, led by Pastor Francis at uh, uh, Post Acute Care Center. There were four saved yesterday. And um, uh, we thank the Lord also for the, the 10 men who showed up yesterday for the, uh, the initial uh, meeting of our men's ministry uh, fellowship. And as we call your name, please stand up so we, you can be uh, reintroduced to our um, church membership because some people are asking, uh, Pastor, you know, um, who are the officers for the men's uh, ministry, men's ministry? And many people were actually hungry during our banquet, so they didn't hear and missed the uh, installation. So. When we call your name, please stand up. Of course, the president this year is Richard Albert Aquino. Please stand. Okay. And then uh, the vice president, okay, uh, Preacher Jun Laksina and Preacher Rex Barcarce. Okay. And then we have um, our secretary, uh, Preacher Jan Galano. Please stand up. Okay. And then, and then we have uh, the. Um, he is also again retained as the treasurer. Uh, Preacher Brian Calixto. Okay. Okay. You were you were you were designated during the installation as the the, the treasurer. So, uh, having said that, let's let's welcome this man. Warm of applause. And for for our brief meeting with uh, with Pastor Hernes and the men's ministry president, we're trying to uh, revamp our men's ministry. It is our prayer that we will be more proactive and more involved this year. And that we will also grow together spiritually. Amen. Uh, so um, I share this with Preacher Albert. Next Sunday, we'll have a meeting, um, men's ministry. And we will try to divide uh, the men's group into four. Okay. So that, you know, these groups will be the one in charge of our projects and also our activity each month. Uh, and having said that, this morning, um, as Pastor was preaching, uh, I was counting the, the presence of men that we have in our auditorium. We have 30 men, but to be exact, if you go down our roster, we have about 46. So that's only one-third or two-thirds of our uh, total men. So uh, after the service, uh, Preacher Brian will go around, okay, and he will collect $5 from each man. Okay? That will be our fund, uh, our seed money, our fund for our men's ministry uh, 2018. So, Richard Bryan would go around. Um, Pastor was talking about condemnation. If you don't give your, you don't give your five dollars, maybe you will lose your salvation. Okay, but please do. Okay, if you can't uh, give it today, you can give it next week. Okay, and uh, another announcement: uh, we are 126 days away from our anniversary. Uh, Pastor announced the uh, change in our date. That will be the Memorial Weekend. So uh, if God has blessed you and you have the money, um, please uh, give the uh, $200 that we're asking for household. Uh, that will serve as our anniversary uh, fund. Okay? And the one that's collecting right now actually is our ladies' ministry. Uh, Sister Lori is here uh, and some other officers. Sister Raquel also here. Uh, so please... Uh, they will be collecting, but the money will be uh, will be entrusted to 
the committee that is handling the, the fund for the anniversary. That is $200 per household. Okay? Any other announcement? Also, uh, in behalf of the choir ministry, so we have a lot of changes this year. Uh, but if you still want to join the choir, you are welcome to do so. Our practices uh, for now is at 8, 15 a.m. in the morning every Sunday. So if you want to join, please come and uh, join us. For the couples, we'd just like to show you something real quick. So couples in Christ resents living in living uh, in love, loving like Christ, live like Christ. So if you see your picture there, you are couples, right? Or and uh, I think it's our way of reminding that you should be there, amen. And last year was a great time we had. Uh, we you see those pine, uh, those coconut trees. Well, those are fake views, but now we will have real views in the. Uh, where's that again? Eve's waterfront. So uh, we'd like to remind everyone to be there. It is now open also for adults, okay? Single adults. Uh, and and uh, so you are welcome. Couples and single adults are welcome. But please uh, pay today and, and registration. Yeah, registration is only until end of the month, January, because we have to give them a head count of how many total number of people who will be joining. So again, it's on February 10, the cost $35 per person. So if you can pay now, pay now, or pay until end of January, thank you. Absolute deadline next uh, Sunday, please. Uh, 
And if you could sponsor couples, there are some couples that could not be able to come because of financial difficulties. Please approach us also if you could sponsor one couple so they, they could come. Thank you so much. Hi, mine will be really fast. Um, the media is off right now, so we're off live broadcast. And I'm like the, uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I don't want to get, um, I don't want to get misunderstood. So we're just doing like media cleanup and media ethics. So if I ever, just a little fine print, if ever I offended, I, I apologize in advance. But I just wanted to let you know that um, effective 2018, the testimonies, we're keeping it to maximum of three minutes. So behind the scene, we have a timer. And um, it's going to have like a, you know, yellow would be like a, you have one minute to wrap it up. And then you have like a red paper that says, please stop. And, and <laughs> I'm very, like I said, I'm very sorry. Gabriel is like, Gabriel, not even, Gabriel, you got to come up here. So we have a timer on, on our screen. And it, it's just, you know, an ongoing thing. Uh, we average about eight to 10 minutes on testimonies and then another eight to 10 minutes on announcement. And um, I, you know, it's funny. It, it, you know, I was just watching uh, Pastor Hernes and I don't know how Pastor Hernes does it, but he's done by like noon, like always on a dot. And I'm like, how does he do that? You know, he just wraps it up and he, it, it's just, he's just always on a dot. Okay. So again, it, if I, it's not my, our intention is just to get it, um, uh, you know, orderly, and we have a systematic way also on the media. And then also on the media, since we're live on Facebook and YouTube, the moment you come over here, you already have viewers. So, and they don't see the crowd. So whoever's talking on Sunday school or whoever is preaching that day, or if you are called to make a, you know, um, every time you're behind the pulpit, Five minutes before you're live, and they don't see the audience, so you don't need to say, oh, there's only 10 people here today, or maybe people are on the way. When you come on over here, you already have viewers. Like, sometimes, before our viewers is like 1, 2, but now our viewers is like 12, 15, and then hundreds, three to 400 on, on review. And we don't do cleanup because we don't have full-time media people yet. What do I mean by cleanup? Cleanup meaning it's recorded. And then we clean it up, and then we take off some, some stuff, and then we broadcast it. Whatever goes on in here is, like, live, okay? So, okay, so, so just real <laughs> quick, So just real quick, um, and the reason for the time cleanup is that we don't want to dip into the main message time frame. So that means less, me less time for Pastor Hernes. So that's okay. so something to keep in mind. Yes. Three minutes. Would that be okay? Okay, so five minutes, we'll just re review that. And then, okay, and then also, um, uh, la last two, um, if you do have video clips that you want, so let's say you are, um, you know, you were asked to preach, and you have a video clip that you wanted to show the audience, uh, we need like two days uh, on, on the media to check it out. We screen every time you see something on the screen, whether it's uh, YouTube or uh, YouTube videos, or this is something that you see on some other video and you want to broadcast or, or you wanted to show it to the congregation. We actually go through them um, and make sure not, not so much of it's legit, it's so much of where the source is coming from. So we need like three at least resources. We do that behind the scene. You, you all don't need to know that. But we, what we're saying is we just need at least two days notice. Not, um, oh, I'm preaching in 10 minutes and I need to show you this. If we say no, please don't get mad. Because we also have our ministry and it's all, you know, we're just doing our best to whom we serve, right? Um, so, so that's what, did I miss anything, Gabe? Um, also, um, if you... I know. For well, like one minute. <laughs> yes, uh, one last thing. Sorry. Is, one last thing is that when you're sitting um, out there in the, uh, on the chairs on, in the uh, stage area, please smile. <laughs> Be smiling for the audience uh, on, uh, online and for everyone else. Amen. And then also on Sunday p.m., people were asking, like, um, Pastor Julius, 
consistently, we'd always send an email with all of our schedule. So with that said, that schedule is now live also on Facebook on IBBC Maine. So if they need to know, oh, what time is our service start at, on Sunday? And if we say, well, 5 p.m. is meditation, according to that thing, 5.30 to 6 o'clock is Bible quiz, six o you know, because it's there, right? So guess what? If we're not, if the service is not on by that time that on Pastor Julius's schedule, we get messages on Facebook like, what time does your service actually start? And these people are like from Canada and East Coast and stuff. And we're like, oh, it's coming up soon. But the schedule said, yeah, so it's, you know, like I said, I don't want to get misunderstood. It's just clean up, okay? Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Jenna makes her way to the front. Just an up update on Nanay uh, Aura. Uh, you know, she gave her membership to our church uh, last November 5. Uh, according to Sister Jenny, uh, she suffered uh, cellulitis. That's her condition. And she's now home resting. And uh, the family thanks the Lord for our church, for our prayers. God bless you. Jenna received uh, Christ uh, as her Savior um, a while back, and she was presented for baptism last Wednesday by, by Pastor Ernest. And uh, this morning, she wants to obey the Lord Jesus Christ in water's baptism. Uh, Jenna, do you know that you're saved? Yes. Do you promise to be faithful to, to God, to His Word, to His church, and to the man of God? Yes. Based on your public profession of faith and the authority given to me by the International Bible Baptist Church, and I baptize you as my sister. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Dead and buried with him in baptism. Rise and walk in the newness of life. Praise God for that. Welcome, Sister Jenna. Let's all stand now as we uh, sing our theme, our IBBC song, theme song. Church with a heart for souls. All together now, from the Bible we read, Jesus Christ says we let the gather those who he saved. To proclaim the good word, he had called them to take up his cause. We're a church with a great heart for souls, set apart to reach the untold. Let's go out to the law, and bring them to the cross. We're a church with a great heart for souls. So say, there is God's well to all, 
Baptize them to the fold and to teach them to follow His plan. We're a church with a great heart for souls, set apart to reach the untold. Let's go out to the lost and bring them to the cross. We're a church with a great heart for souls. On the chorus again. We're a church with a great heart for souls, set apart to reach the untold. Let's go out to the lost and bring them to the cross. We're a church with a great heart for souls. And we have birthday celebrants for this January. January 22nd, Brother Butch Ramirez, they're out of town. January 26th, Nesto Banayos, and also Sister Risa Barcarce, right? And Sister Alice Ordonio and Sister Jean Arenas. Let's sing a viewer here. Ah, Jean, you there? Sit in. Oh, oh, Sister Risa and Sister Alice and Arnold. Arnold. Okay, January 19th. Please come and let's sing for you. Okay, let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. Born again means salvation. shake their hands and also wedding anniversary preacher Jerome and sister Fernanda Cervantes let's sing again for them happy anniversary to you happy anniversary to you may God bless you on this wonderful day may God give celebrate happy wedding anniversary to you happy wedding anniversary to you amen okay let's welcome uh, brother roderick brother jojo and sister lb back from the philippines hey. Hey. oh there you go i thought he left hey. but uh, let me call uh, brother roderick please come and dismiss us in prayer please come Let us pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day that you allowed us to meet in your house. Thank you, O oh God, for the message that we have heard. Thank you, Lord, for the pastor that, uh, that he shared to us the, your word, O oh God. Lord, uh, help us to be, uh, to be worthy, O oh God, of the words that we have heard. Thank you, Lord, for the, um, all the blessings. And Lord, um, may you dismiss us, O oh God your blessings. For in Jesus' name, this we pray. Gracias. 